ABC Sports and the Olympics, a long-standing partnership. Again, at the Winter Games of Calgary, the Olympic tradition continues. The National League champion St. Louis Cardinals against the American League champion Minnesota Twins in the 1987 World Series. But how much of a home field advantage is this for the Minnesota Twins? Well, I'll tell you, Al, I can't really think of a team since the 1961 Yankees who have more of a home field advantage than the Minnesota Twins. They are 60 and 25 this year at the Metrodome. The one problem today is the matchup. They have Les Straker going against John Tudor, and consider Les Straker. He was 8 and 10 on the regular season. However, he did pitch very, very well against the Cardinals. The one thing to remember today is I think, Al, that the Minnesota Twins are going to be playing this uh, game today. Even though it's game six, they'll be playing it like it's game seven because, after all, if they lose this ball game, uh, they will be going home and have a long winter. And for that reason, I think Les Straker, if he's in trouble, will be removed early. Might even see Reardon a little bit earlier because, yep. as you say, if they don't win today, yep. there is no tomorrow. Let me turn to Jim Palmer now. Let's talk about the fact the first two games, the, the Twins did what they've done so well, successfully all season long, hit hit with power. Cardinals did their thing at home with speed. Now, do you necessarily feel the Twins would have the upper hand, the major advantage over these next two games, if there are two games? Well, you never have a major advantage if you have to face John Tudor, but if you go back to the playoffs, they faced two guys from the Tigers, talking about the Twins here in Minneapolis. Doyle Alexander came in 9-0 and in his last 11 starts. They beat him, and then Jack Morris had not lost in the Metrodome eight times in a row and yet they beat him but the interesting thing to me about this world series is in the first two games which were blowouts 10 to 1 and 8 to 4 you never really heard much about the cardinal speed then they go to st louis and what happens is they steal eight bases a three-run inning a six-run inning and another three-run inning and they come here leading so we are all set now for game six of the 1987 world series tudor and straker at the dome The Homer Hankies out in force, saluting the Minnesota Twins as they just took the field. And the lineup for the Cardinals, Coleman leading off. He came to the park with the flu. Smith bats second. Tommy Herr hitting third in the Cardinal lineup with Dreesen, the cleanup batter. And then the switch hitting Willie McGee. Terry Pendleton is in the lineup today. He is the DH. Again, the DH in effect in the American League Park. Ford. Game five hero, bat seventh, Okendo, who moves around, plays third, and Tony Pena bats ninth in the lineup with Tudor, the pitcher. Now for Minnesota defensively, the outfield is Gladden, Puckett, and Brunanski. The infield, as usual, Gaetti, Gaffney, Lombardozzi, and Herbeck. Tim Laudner is back of the plate, and Les Straker on the mound, who pitched very well the other night. And once again, let's get the inside pitch on Straker from the Milwaukee Brewers, Paul Molitor. The important factor for Les Straker being effective is getting through those first few innings. He has a tendency early in the ball game to give up big innings. Now what happens is he'll get a few runners on base and get a little bit flustered. Now, as a hitter, the advantage will swing in your direction. If you can just be patient in these situations, eventually he's going to give you a good pitch to hit in these run-scoring situations. And the other night, he pitched brilliantly, and Kelly will take that right to the bank. If you could tell Tom right now, and Reggie asked him the other night after the game, if he gets six innings, are you going to yank him again? And Tom said, absolutely. And Paul Molitor said that he gets flustered in the early innings. Well, the other night, he didn't have a chance to get flustered because Cardinal runners weren't on, but if they get on, if anybody can fluster you, the Cards can. Well, especially the guy with the flu that can fly. And, <laughs> and we're talking about Coleman. He has six stolen bases. And as we said in the opening, the difference between this series is who has been able to get on in which ballpark. They, have, they weren't able to do it here. A lot of runs, and it doesn't matter. Terry Tata of the National League is the plate umpire along with the rest of the crew. If we went to a seventh game, it would mean Dave Phillips, the first base umpire, who was the plate umpire in game one, would call him tomorrow. And Vince Coleman to lead things off. Coleman, Smith, and Her. Something happened just then that I have never seen. Vince Coleman came out and had the home plate umpire, Terry Tata, check the ball. I mean, for what reason? The ball hasn't been in play yet. 
Well, I'll tell you what reason. A lot of times, some umpires rub the ball more than others, and they all put the, the river mud on it, and some are much darker. So if you're a leadoff hitter, you want to know if it's too dark. Crescendo builds for the first pitch of the game, and it's outside. And again, Coleman not feeling well, coming to the park and dragging. And so obviously a touch of the flu or under the weather, but still in the lineup in game six. Smith and Hurd to follow. Takes a strike. And speaking of dragging, a very good bunter. 44 infield hits, 14 bunch. You can see Gary Gaetti playing well in front of the bag at third, and that's what you have to do. He's still going to bunt because if he bunts it to the right side, you can see how deep Larbordozzi is playing. He can beat the pitcher to the bag. One and two. The crowd has picked right up where they left off last Sunday. I mean, they are in ninth inning form in the first inning. Some of them, as a matter of fact, came out here. If you remember the other night, 29,000 strong. They paid a dollar to get in. The money went to charity and made themselves a ball. Well, this is the pitch that Whitey Herzog said is a better than a major league average fastball. It's about 90 miles per hour in St. Louis. It looks even quicker here in the dome where the hitters say they don't pick up the ball as well. So Coleman gone. Ozzie Smith, 5 for 20 in the series. Smith, 303 during the regular season. And once again, a much better left-handed hitter. He batted 335 left-handed. out of play and it's one and one I was very impressed with the comments that Les Straker not only impressed the way he pitched in game three but he said hey this is another game you say that but I think he learned a lot from that really his second postseason play which was, was that third game because he threw strikes he found out what he had to do to be successful and if they could do it today it'll be successful again two and one on Ozzie Smith Straker we told you about him the other night when he pitched in game three Ten years in the minors. His wife helped kept him going and interested in baseball, and he finally got a shot at this series in Venezuela. 28 years old. To center field.
look on a slider threw a fastball by him and then he does speed up his back when he gets a slider in the middle of the plate. Tim Lodner and hitting ninth in the order is Steve Lombardozzi and they'll be facing John Tudor the winner in game three and let's get the inside pitch on John from the San Diego Padres Tony Gwynn the National League batting champion. John Tudor's real deliberate so it appears that he, he's overpowering but I think it's his windup that really lulls you to sleep. Uh, he's got great composure on the mound nothing ever rattles him. And when he's on, he's really tough to hit. You can't go up there and sit on one pitch. You've got to go up there and just try to get your bat on the ball. But if he doesn't have his good stuff, then he has a tendency to be wild high. But I think the reason why he's been so effective is the development of his changeup. Defensively, Coleman, McGee, and Ford in right. The infield of Okendo at third, then Smith, Purr, and Dreesen. Tony Pena does the catching for St. Louis. And John Tudor trying to clinch a championship. He leads 1-0 on a home run by Tommy Hur. And Dan Gladden, who is the only player to get a hit in all five World Series games thus far. Gladden to lead off and Gagney and Puckett. It was Dan who started the World Series with the Grand Slam home run in game one on Saturday night. And there's Les Straker who set down the first two, got a hit on Tommy Hur, and the next thing you know, it's in the upper deck. The reaction of Straker as her shot left the park. It's not the first time a pitcher will close his eyes after a home run. some 
too much. What you want to do is limit them. Now Gagne helps Tudor out by swinging the ball and down and away. Tudor's strength against Gagne's weakness. But Tudor does not. He'll give up that run. You don't, if you get the first guy out, then maybe you want to strike out the next batter. You don't want to have a big inning and put your team out, especially when you're waiting three games to two. Two, two pitch. There's a one hopper to her. And he looks Gladden back and throws him out. Gladden was sort of frozen when the ball left the bat with the infield back. Gladden had to hesitate, and then by the time he decided he might come home, it was too late. And that's because of the perception of looking at Tommy Hill. The ball hit right in. He reminded it for the runner at third and less than two out to watch the line drive. That was a line drive fielded on one hop. You can certainly understand the plight of Dan Gladden on that particular mm -hmm. play. It's the kind of play where if he, he hits a two hopper, he comes home. Right. So despite the infield playing back, the ball hit on a line far enough that Gladden was frozen. And the Cardinals get a pretty much a gift out in this situation without yielding the run. Bucket the back. He can hit that pitch, but hasn't been able to do it. That's grounded in the left field to tie the game. The reason they've been pitching him inside is because of the 28 home runs. They feel they can tie him up. At that time, you can see Tudor shaking his head. He knows he made a mistake, gave him something out over the plate. What's your reach for this ball? More or less right in the middle of the plate. Smith way up the middle and you have a run. Thank you. 
at the go-ahead single by Don Baylor. What's pain you? Way inside, look where the ball is. Out over the plate. He misses literally by about two and a half feet. Tudor cannot do that be successful. Really a fine point, Jim, because you can see Pena go all the way from inside off the plate to outside off the plate. And this is three days rest for Tudor. A lot of people feel that would be beneficial to him in a way because he's a control field pitcher. Does not have his control as of yet. So the Cardinals are Smith, and Tudor and Vince Coleman, Ozzie talking about hitting and Tudor talking about or thinking about the bottom of the first inning. Out of the second, leading things off is McGee, who will be followed by Pendleton and Ford. Funny, McGee having a good series, but fanning a lot. The Kirk Lyla and the Kirk Hall are good to give up. Really, what such extremes. And here's a guy that. Hitter doesn't really try to pull the ball. Only 11 home runs on the year. These both teams in hitting and hitting and strikeouts. Outside high fastball. 
Hobbs off toward the middle. Lombard Dozy is there to make a nice play and get him. Lombard Dozy was over toward the middle and able to make a strong throw to nail the game. Good God. Right exactly where he should, up the middle. You see him really not going that far to his right, but he does know that McGee can run, plants, and fires. He's played an outstanding second base throughout this World Series. Again, defensing the hitter properly is the key to this play. So one down, and Pendleton is the batter. Terry, the DH, and again, Pendleton hurt, injured himself in Game 7 of the National League Championship Series. Rip muscle. He can bat left-handed. He could not earlier in the series play 30. Still can't bat right-handed, but Herzog can use him. He said now a couple of innings in the field if necessary. He can play third, at least for a little while. Two and up. Hitless. 
Crescendo's back has secret weapon on it. It's a special model made up by Louisville Slugger. They sent him three with secret weapon on it. Go ahead. Three and one. Another look so you can read it. There it is. Secret weapon. I'm not too sure that weapon's secret anymore. No, he's used it too much. Mm -hmm. So is Whitey Herzog. The job he did for Whitey all season long. Starting at seven positions and playing eight. I'm sure he's gonna throw some curveballs. He likes throwing a lot of curveballs to left-handed hitters, and uh, I know he'll throw a few in there. But you can't you can't sit and look at the curveball because he's sneaking there with the fastball, which he did to me uh, over at their place. But uh, I'm I'm looking for fastballs to hit, and if I can sit back and, and keep my weight back, I can I can react to a curveball and, and uh, you know hopefully slap it the other way or something. Ken Herbeck will struggle through the playoffs and through the series. He's four for 17 now. The number seven hitter and starts him with a curve, does two to ball one. That's what Johnson's biggest problem is, uh, is that he faces nine right handers, or, excuse me, eight right handers, one lefty. He said sometimes he has trouble with his control. And the only person he throws curveballs to are 
one left-hander, so he'd like to see a few more in there. It makes his job a little bit easier. You can see uh, that Kent does not hit left-handers very well. Half swing, fastball, and the count two and one. Nor the fastball up. He is a low ball hitter, 34 home runs, 285, one of his best years ever. That's because yeah. Kent's a, an ex-hockey player. I would imagine that hockey players with that type of swing would be more inclined to hit the ball down. Richie Hepler, another one. John Tudor, also a hockey player. That's right. After the 1985 series, as a matter of fact, John Tudor, they were doing a story on him, Sports Illustrated, and he suited up and skated with the St. Louis Blues hockey team. We'll never know about Kirk McCaskill because he plays in the league with the DH. That's right. But he was the best of the baseball players. Picked off. 
but the key to beating the Cardinals is to get way ahead. One run, they have the favorite. They're definitely favorites. Gladden tries to bunt his way on, and it's a foul ball. They have showed demonstrably over the last three games that anytime they want to run, they can run. And we saw in 10 to 1, 8 to 4, they're not going to run. And if they do, it doesn't really make any difference. So every run is valuable. Two, two, tie. The bottom of the second inning, game six of the World Series. Cardinals leading three games to two. Lombardozzi at first base. Two down. at the Metrodome in Minneapolis. Al Michaels with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver. Game six of the World Series. Game seven if the Twins win. Tomorrow night it would start at 8 Eastern, 5 o'clock on the West Coast. And the Cardinals will send to the mound either Danny Cox or Joe McGrain. Whitey Herzog unsure. It'll probably be a committee tomorrow night. <laughs> and Minnesota with Frank Viola. We know that. Third inning, Coleman, Smith, and Her coming up. Coleman struck out in the first. So Les Stryker, who gave Kelly six good innings the other night, has been touched for a run tonight or today in each of the first two. And he starts with Coleman here in the third. Going one on Vince, who we told you before, came to the park with a touch of the flu tonight. strikes and when he becomes a work better contact hitter it's going to be unbelievable they're never he's going to that's when he's going to steal the 200 bases that he talks about one two two it's slowly to Lombard Dozy has to hurry and gets it one down in the third and Ozzy Smith coming to the plate Reggie Jackson interviewed Kelly the other night he, he asked him what would you do if Straker gives you another six and he's coming out. Another look here at the play by Lombardozzi. And of course, it's Kelly who knows his glove, and Dick Sutch, the pitching coach. Well, he averaged about, you know, average about five and a third innings on the year. He gives him six shot in, shutout innings. You have your bullpen, Baron Gare, 8 and 1, Reardon with 31 saves, and they all second guess the move. Incredible. Well, you see some interesting figures that we have. 2-0 the count with about Straker. There he is in the regular year, and he's 1 through 6. Look at him on the far right. In addition to the ERA, 242 the opponent's hit. From the 7th on, they hit 420. 
Only 52 at that's because he didn't go that far into the seventh, but still revealing enough to show how he weakens after the seventh inning. And Tom Kelly said clearly it was mental as far as he was concerned. Two old pitches hit in the air to right field and deep, and back goes Bernanski and makes the catch. Only one home run left handed in his major league career. That was in the 1985 championship series against the Dodgers off Tom Needenfuhrer to win a ball game in game five in St. Louis after over 3,100 at bats without a home run from the left side. Here's Tommy Hur now in the first inning. Tommy with two out, drilled one into the upper deck, and that got the Cardinals off and running, made it 1 0. Twins got two in the bottom of the first, Cardinals got out of the second. You get an idea of why it's so difficult to pitch here. In Bush Stadium, you would literally have come in on Ozzie Smith's ball. Uh, this is the kind of park where the pitching coach will tell you, get ahead, change speeds, and use all your pitches. And that's what Straker did to her. The slider got in the middle of the plate and he jerked it. Bush Stadium, you could throw Tommy Hur fastballs away. It's such a big ballpark that you know he might get his hits, but he's not going to hurt you with a home run. Here you change speeds a little bit more, you're more susceptible to long balls. Yesterday at the airport, we took a decibel meter out there, and within 100 feet of the runway, it registered 102 decibels. That was yesterday at Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. And here is a live decibel meter inside the Metrodome. And the crowd not really doing very much right now, only in the 90s on the D meter. But they'll get it up there. Don't tell them about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bottom of the third inning, Kirby Puckett from the off. Game time, 2 2. And Puckett spins a foul off the end of the bat of the county's own ball. I'll tell you, Al, they have indoor track records. Maybe they should have indoor home run records. A major league record with 21 indoor home runs this season. And he didn't hit them all here. He had 18 here, three in the Kingdom in Seattle. Kirby Puckett had the tools in fact, the Cardinals, Jim Herbeck, had the tools with home runs in this ballpark with 20. New indoor record. Puckett fouls it away, and in a couple of years, you'll have the, uh, well, the hybrid ballpark in Toronto because they'll have the retractable roof where you'll be able to hit them both inside and out, depending Montreal, on the weather. Montreal also. Well, Montreal totally, yeah, inside right now, completely enclosed, and, and Houston, of course, with the non batters out in. I mean, just home runs. I'm mean, nervous. Well, what they've done to Puckett, and he's allowed him to do it, and he's got the hit. We saw the one scoring single the last time. They pitched him inside, and they've taken away his power. It's like you wanted to pitch to Mark McGuire with 49 home runs. You want a single or home run. You wanted a single, and that's what they've done to Puckett. Stayed away. Not a lot of breaking balls. Stayed in on him. When he does get his hits, they'll be singles, and that one will be triple.
Tam of Boar Heaven. Dietti now. Puck into it. 12 steals during the regular season held on by Andreessen. Dietti, the MVP of the American League Championship Series. Takes away. One and all. What a variety of pitches that he's hit. We saw him hit the hanging slider for a home run here. We saw the triple that McGee made a great effort on, on a fastball 97 miles per hour from Todd Bowell. Hit it 414 feet. The only pitch he is not really consistently hit in the series is the ball down in the strike zone. And that's where Tudor liked to be. Two and oh. Tudor is not a sinker ball pitcher. He is a low ball pitcher. He was talking about that. He said, everybody thinks I throw a, a sinker. He said, all I do is hold the ball with the seam, run it away from the right-handers, throw the changeup, and then when I want to come in on him, throw it with across the seams and ride it up and in. That's a cross to seam grip. Now, that's a grip he can change. We can't see that because he's inside the glove. In the air to deep right field, and Ford goes back and has room and makes the catch at the edge of the warning track as Bucket retreats. So one long out, one gone in the third inning, and Don Baylor comes to the plate. He singled in the first. I'll tell you, the impressive thing about this Twins lineup is how they've approached Tudor the second time around. Gladden with the triple down the right field line. Only Puckett, of all the hits, they have six hits, only Puckett has pulled the ball. Everybody else has gone the other way, including Baylor, his first at bat. Pops it up. Pena having trouble with it. Tony coming back and makes the catch. <laughs> well, he did not see that ball when it went off the bat. Somehow, he saw it on the way down and, and made the out. I think he even lost it partially on the way down. He kind of, he kind of gave a shrug there, yeah. Jim. I think that's one of the strangest yeah. reactions I've ever seen. Well, that's a little late. I believe he sees it right now, but a little bit earlier, he's just looking. Knew it was behind him, but didn't know where. I think he may have lost it twice. Yeah. Going up and somewhere when it comes down. Let's watch look at yeah, it one watch more Right now there, he doesn't. There he sees no. it. Now watch this. Yeah, it's like he, he loses says, it again. Minute. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's almost a shrug. Yeah. <laughs> Great shot. Oh, that was terrific. Two down, and pocket goes. He gets a big break, and there's no throw. Uncontested steal. That's what we were talking about. A lot of times you'll run on a left-hander's first move. Now, if he goes immediately, see, he just goes on the move. The Tudors picked off 11 runners last year, five this year, so he has a good move, but he chose to really go to home plate. Puckett took a gamble, and it worked out. Brunanski with a count 1-0, and oh, and first base open, and John can figure who would rather work to here, Brunanski, the right-handed batter, and he's got Herbeck, the left-hand batter, on deck. And Herbeck is 0 for 14 against left-handers in postseason play and hit 225 against them this year. I'm a little surprised they're pitching to Brunanski here. Well, they're just barely pitching yeah. to him. They may walk him now. Yeah, 3-0. and Tudor with... Only two and two-thirds innings gone. Already a gross. Well, this is something with a veteran pitcher. You know he'll pitch around him. If it's a rookie, need and cure with first base open with, with, with Clark up in the 85. I'll go to see if you're listening. A hundred shy of a gross. <laughs> and outside, <laughs> four, four. Had he thrown it gross, <laughs> he'd have been back in the clubhouse. Look, yeah, this is a situation where he's trying to make a perfect pitch. I don't really think he wants to pitch to him, and it's obvious. He misses by, what, two feet after missing by three feet? The only problem with this, if Herbeck 
And over the year, as Timmy said, did not hit that well average-wise at the 34 home runs. Only six against left-handed hitters. But if you make a mistake, it's five to two. Two on, two out. Two-two tie. Bottom of the third inning. Herbeck, one and zero. There are mistakes that are made with the wrong approach. There are mistakes that are made with the right approach. If you take the right approach enough, and Whitey Herzog does that, you'll make fewer mistakes. games but I'll tell you what tell Tudor that if he hangs a curveball or a fastball here and, and Herbeck hits it in the upper deck well you <laughs> can't have that built in though if you've got something like that built in then you're really going to make a mistake you got to go at it with full conviction and that's what Herzog and, and really Tudor does the same thing three and all not only is Tudor throwing a lot of pitches but remember he's pitching on three days rest. Again the checkpoint on John Tudor is glove to the knee and he's there but again you got to understand who's up 34 home runs crowd 50, gets louder 55,000 people yes. Yep it's more than a 727. We do, we do. <laughs> Still in place is the roof. But it's wobbling. Three out of Herbeck coming up. Strike. A curveball, three and oh. Talk about having confidence in your curveball after seven straight balls. Bob Forsh in the Cardinal bullpen. Game tied 2-2, two, two, two out, two on, and three and one on Herbeck. High fly ball to left center field, and Tudor's going to work out of it if Coleman can keep his eye on it, and he does. No runs ahead. They leave two to the fourth. We go a 2-2 two, two tie. Dave Phillips, the first base umpire, we understand, has confirmed that the ball that Pena caught hit that speaker on the way down. Remember how odd the reaction was with Pena? It must have grazed the speaker and it grazed it to the point where it probably did not affect very much the trajectory of the ball as Dreesen drills one to right field and Brunanski will have to play it off the canvas his throw in the second is offline a double for Dreesen to start the fourth inning a very similar pitch to Tommy Herr hit for a home run it's a high slider Dreesen a double off the hefty bags in the second game does it again and the only thing left is Brunanski playing it so well off the fence, something he's done all year. Strong, strong throw to second. But Dreesen in easily. See Lombardozzi, the cutoff man, getting out of the way. Not a good pitch, but I believe Timmy 1 0. He thought it might fool him, and it didn't. Willie McGee now, who grounded out in the second inning. First time the cards have had the leadoff man on, and McGee fouls it away on one. The ruling, by the way, on a, on a ball such as that is that if it hits the speaker, it is in play. And remember Pena's reaction after he had caught the ball. Huh. Yeah. How about that? I stayed with it. Of course, it doesn't make it doesn't take much to get him to smile. Oh, no, you're right. And that's drilled in the center field for a base hit. Dreesen, after hesitating, is being held at third. And down to second as the throw goes over the head of the cutoff man, Gaetti, goes McGee. Dreesen, on a line shot through the middle, was hesitating. And that cost him any chance to score. And then when Puckett misses Gaetti, it allows McGee to go to second. Second and third, and nobody out. I can understand Dreesen right there. 
You're watching the line drive the short stops behind you. There's nobody out. No hurry to go home, but really a hurry as far as Kirby Puckett's concerned to hit the cutoff man, and he fails to do that. Willie McGee, very alert base running. And you talk about a hurry. It is Juan Berenguer going to the bullpen for Minnesota, and he will get some company as well in the person of Dan Schatzeter. This is it for the Twins. There is no tomorrow. So they'll go to the pen early if needed. Pendleton swinging at a change. 0 and 1. What's so surprising about that play by Kirby Puckett is you don't see it during the regular season. It, nobody out. Balls hit hard. You know that Dreesen, you don't assume that Dreesen's going to stop at third, but you just come up, hit off, cut off man, keep a double play in order, keep the big inning from being a possibility. Infield is back and it's grounded to the right side and it's a foul ball. So still nothing in two. Dreesen going back to third and McGee the runner at second with nobody out of the fourth inning. The game tied 2 2. It's more understandable for an outfielder to miss a cutoff man with two outs than with nobody out. With two outs, Dreesen wouldn't have been concerned with the line drive probably would have scored and you're taking a legitimate shot at getting it getting him at home so an outfielder like the base runner has to take into account how many outs there are. Oh and two the count on Pendleton. One and two. Led the Cardinals in that department, as a matter of fact. Shatters is bad, or at least splinters it, and he'll get a new one with a count one ball and two strikes. That's caused from the end of the bat being poured out. You see that happen when a hitter hits the ball off the end of the bat. And it's one of the reasons he hit the ball right. off the end of the bat is what we talked about earlier, the three changes of Bill Kendo. This time he started him with a changeup, threw a fastball by him, missed with a slider, came back with a changeup. A little bit difference in the speeds of the pitches. You have him out in front. You don't get the out, but you should get him at least to go back and get a new bat. But you've used different speeds, and you set up pretty now. You can throw him just about anything you want, especially hard stuff on the inside part of the plate. One two pitch a little chopper to the right side it's going to score a run and the flip back to Straker too late everybody safe. So the cards lead and have runners at first and third and nobody out. We talked about the veteran John Tudor not pitching that well and the rookie Les Straker makes a rookie mistake something that shouldn't happen he should go directly to first he doesn't hesitates. And Pendleton with the rib still beats him. Very simple, something you work on every day in spring training. Yeah, there are two ways the pitcher covers the bag, and one way is to act like a first baseman. And that should have been the time that Straker gets to the bag and then stretches even like a first baseman. What you try to do, you try to gauge how fast the runner is. And when you do, and Pendleton can run, you get to first base as quickly as you can. Take the most direct route. Tom Kelly now goes to the mound. The lefty Schatzeter, the righty Baron Gare. It scored as an infield single for Pendleton. And so the Twins, after squandering opportunities in the second and in the third, and with the game tied, see the Cardinals get a run here in the third inning to take the lead and the makings of a big inning, and he's going to go to the bullpen. And the call goes out for Dan Schatzeter, the lefty, to come in in the fourth inning of game six. The cards are ahead. Last time the Cards were in the World Series in game six they had a one nothing lead in the ninth inning and then this grounder starting the inning Orta called safe by Don Denkinger on the call at first base the ensuing argument with Whitey Herzog to no avail of course that game ended with Dane Orge singling the drive in two to win the game square the series and that World Series ended with Brett Saberhagen throwing a shutout in game seven and Kansas City winning the series but that's history and now the president with the Cardinals leading and Jim Lindemann batting for Kurt Ford with Shatzer working. 
3 2. Cardinals on top. Still nobody out in the inning with McGee at third and Pendleton at first. And Jim Lindemann with Ford on the bench now. The left hand batter seated as Shaxeter comes in to face Lindemann. This is a situation if you're Tom Kelly, you're trying to cut your losses. Double play man at the at the plate if you can induce him to hit a ground ball at somebody. You'll give up the run to get out of the inning and stay away from a real big inning. A lot of time to go. Oh and two. Chester pitched in both game four and five. Did not have a very good year. The, the record belies really how poorly he pitched. He said he doesn't really know why, but 64 hits and only 43 innings. One and two. It's a funny situation for a double play ball. Most double play balls are balls that are away. Lindemann's weakness, however, is inside. One two pitch to Lindemann. Off the hands and a little pop up and Gaetti is there with Gagne and it's Gaetti making the catch and the runners hold as Gary runs the ball back into the infield. A big out. A real big out. And where did he go? Right where Jim said. About belt high and look about four or five inches off the plate. Of course that's the key to getting ahead. If you get ahead you have an option. McGee tags. Gaetti knows he's going to catch it. And then runs it back into the infield. So now Okendo comes up. Remember Okendo a switch hitter. He hit 277 right handed. He hit 294 left handed. One little oddity though despite fewer at bats right handed he hit into four double plays from this side and only two the other way. And the infield a double play depth. And there's always the possibility of the squeeze. If you're the runner at third base on the squeeze play you don't want to break too soon. If you break too soon you give it away and the pitcher and catcher do one of two things. They either pitch out or knock the hitter down depending on what your philosophy is. So it's very important Eddie Stanky used to say that if you're the runner on third squeeze situation and it's on take one step back before that will prevent you from leaving too soon. Okendo takes a strike. Another thing about Okendo, we mentioned he's prone to hitting the more double plays this way, but on the other side of that same coin, he hit four sacrifice flies this year, all of them right handed. And the two home runs are from the right side, so the chance of hitting a fly ball are better. And he's looking for a pitch up in the strike zone. And he hits a high fly ball to right field, and McGee tags. Brunanski on the run makes the catch, and Brunanski with an off balance throw way off the mark, and the Cardinals get another run, and down to second goes Pendleton. So Okendo, who hit all four of his sack flies right handed, hits one here, and the Cardinals are on top by two. And a tough play for Brunanski because he's going the other way. Would have been a much easier play for a left handed thrower. Oh, with two out, well, two outs, he's going to catch that ball because it's fair. But right now, he does not know. I mean, he has to know that he doesn't have a play. And by trying to desperately throw the runner out, he allows another runner to go into scoring position, Terry Pendleton, and just gives the Cardinals another chance to add a run. Yeah, you remember game three of the American League Championship Series? Brunanski had a similar play, but he was set down the right field line. And Tony Kubek and Bob Costas properly alluded to the fact that Brunanski could have been in foul territory. However, the replay did show that he was in fair territory. Mm -hmm. Tony Pena now looks at a strike on the outer half, 0 and 1. 4 2 St. Louis in the fourth inning. Two down. Handled in at second. Shatsider with the Phillies and the Expos and the Giants, and that's why a lot of the Cardinals have experience having faced him. Yeah. 
One and one. Typical Pena rip in the count one and two. A typical smile. <laughs> it appears that he is really seeing the ball so much better than he did during the season. Take a look for yourself. Notorious bad ball hitter. That ball is pretty much in the middle of the plate, but a little bit out of the strike zone. And if he, he's going to hit a home run, I'm not sure if it's going to be on that ball. I would think he'd like the ball down better, but the ball he's going to drive to right field and has done it all the time has been that ball out over the plate. Going to third on a pitch inside and the throw not in time. Terry Pendleton. Terry Pendleton, he of the pulled muscle, legs out a hit, steals a base, and has already scored a run. The last time he was on second base, the count three and two, Okendo the batter, and he was running on that play. So I really think he's trying to deliver a message to Whitey Herzog. If this game goes to seven, he's starting tomorrow. Two, Maybe. 2-2 two, two missing, and Pena goes to first. The board had it 2-2. Two and two. Pena is now being pulled back. He thought it was ball four. It's only ball three. And he enjoys a laugh with Terry Tater. Do you know the other night, do you remember when Pena looked like he was hurt in game five? He was at first base, he reached first base, and he reached for his hamstring, and he was flexing his foot. He wasn't hurt at all. He was trying to decoy the Twins into thinking he was hurt. He really wanted to steal on the next pitch, but he decoyed was Whitey. Whitey took yeah. him out for a pinch runner. Lance Johnson, who went in and stole second. How great was that? <laughs> <laughs> Foul away again, three and two. <laughs> I've never heard of that happening before. Nor have I. <laughs> three and two to count. Two down. Check swing, ball four. No swing, says Dave Phillips. And so the Cardinals get Coleman to the plate. Runners at first and third, two down, and Vince 0 for two. Well, another run on third base. You don't want to give him a pitch that you've already seen that he had good swings out, and that's the fastball, so you hook him. But it turns out to be ball four. Very close. I think Dave Phillips made the right call. He called it quickly. And that way, there's no argument. Right or wrong, at least you're quick about it. <laughs> Coleman hitting right-handed for the first time today. He hit 268 right-handed this year. And there he is in postseason this year. And what a swing. Both he and Ozzie Smith are hitless right-handed in the World Series. One and one. Well, that's what you have to do when you're trailing. Sometimes you have to take that gamble. Who do you want to face? And the numbers support what Dan Chester is doing. Strike two. One and two. It's a good way to have Coleman not leading off the next inning if you get him out. Two on, two out. 4 2 Cardinals, fourth inning. Pendleton at third, Pena at first. Pena goes and it's fouled away. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. 
It was suggested to me this past summer that with Vince Coleman, one of the ways to stop him from running in the National League, of course, there's no DH, is that with, with two outs and nobody on, walk the pitcher, pitch to Coleman, clock up the bases, thereby <laughs> never allowing him to steal second base. Suggested to you by whom? Uh, by more than one person. Pena goes again, and Coleman reaches for it, fouls it back. None of whom I agree with. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the great lines by the columnist Jim Murray back in 1966. We went out to L.A., and they said, Just, as long as you keep the Dodgers off the base, especially Maury Wills, you can win. So McNally walked the bases loaded, and that's what Jim Murray said. He stopped their running attack cold. He walked the bases loaded. <laughs> Brought in Drabowski. He struck out 11 and 5 and 2 thirds inning, and we were off and running. Pendleton at third. And Pena, who's been off and running on the last two pitches at first. One, two to Coleman. High drive to center field. Puckett going all the way back to the track and makes the catch. But they get two to the cards to lead by two after three and a half. I asked Whitey Herzog before the game if he'd be inclined to remove Tudor earlier today because he was working on three days rest. No, Al. Actually, he's worked so many times in his life with three days rest. In 85, I think his record was 18 and 1 on three days rest. And going into the seventh game of the World Series. And uh, the thing with John is sometimes he has a lot better control coming back with three days. I would probably go get him today if he got up to around 100 pitches in the seventh inning and I had Don Baylor or somebody coming up there, I'd probably go to Warrell. If it was Herbeck, I'd probably go to Daly and go with my power pitchers. But I'm just shooting dice a little bit. I feel that if they win this ball game today and I, I, I save Tudor for the seventh game, that would be very tough for us to beat them. I think the momentum would switch. They would feel they definitely got an advantage. So I'm trying to take advantage of what we got going for us by pitching Tudor today. And so far, Tudor has given him the lead, though he's been very shaky through three, and the Twins have squandered a couple of golden opportunities to score. 4-2 St. Louis, bottom of the fourth inning, Laudner, Lombardozzi, and Gladden. And Jim Lindemann stays in the game in right field for St. Louis. High fly ball to center. McGee there looking up, and remember, nothing's routine. One away. Steve Lombard Dozy is the batter. A reminder, those of you on the West Coast of the Pacific Time Zone coming up following the World Series, the California Golden Bears and the UCLA Bruins. Lombard Dozy singled in the second inning. I really don't buy what Whitey Herzog said. I believe. Tudor is a control pitcher, but as Frank Viola said, he said it's easy to pitch every fourth day with only three days rest if you've been doing it all year. And of course, if this does go to seven games, we will see Viola for the second time with only three days rest. You something told, you did last year. Very I guess often. you could uh, relate that to your career, Jim. You told us the other day that you never, for the most part, worked with four days rest. You were always in a four man rotation. But we did it all during the season, so it didn't really matter. I uh -huh. saw Mike Cuellar pitch with two days rest, but he had done it a couple of times. Two balls, no strikes to count. One out, bases empty, bottom of the fourth inning. Cards leading 4-2. That's ground. It's a fair ball. Coleman will chase it down, and Lombardozzi has a double. Well, once again, control is so more important. He gets the ball inside, and Lombardozzi, second hit, wraps it down the line, kicks off the bag, and Coleman still is not going to get to it. Lombardozzi with pretty good speed. They've had more pitches to hit tonight than they did in seven innings. Talking about good pitches off Tudor, mainly because he's just not that sharp. And they've adjusted, as you said, to Dan Gladden now with the infield outside of Okendo playing back. 
And he hits it in the air to deep left center field. Coleman and McGee converge, and McGee makes the play. They avoid the collision, and Lombardozzi has to remain at second. And that is really tough with the ceiling and the noise and knowing you get the two speedsters on a collision course. I'll tell you, you get the feeling that if the Cardinals lose this game, faulty outfield play could have something to do with it. The Herbeck ball back in the second inning, the error on McGee, and now Coleman and McGee almost colliding, avoiding serious injury. Well, getting back to what I said, they cannot look at each other because if they do, you lose the ball here, and that's different. If you, an outfielder will tell you, once you see the ball, they know where it's going to come down. They look at each other to see if somebody's going to run them off. That's not the case here. That ball almost rolled into Coleman's glove. It was that close. Gagney swinging and missing 0-1. You're also making that point, Jim, that you got to play the outfield differently in this ballpark, and it's tough to change old habits. Well, that's the, that's why they say they didn't think that the background would bother them, the lights would bother them, but they did think the, the style of the way you play the fly ball would, and it's bothered everybody that's come in here. Two out, Lombardozzi at second. In the fourth. Chased it. 0-2. I mean, in all fairness to the other 12 teams that do play in the American League, it's a very unfair advantage to have a white roof that they can't become accustomed to. And by the time they do, they've already left. And all you have to do is paint not the roof, but the panels up there. It certainly would take away a lot of the advantage to the Twins, which I'm sure would make them very unhappy, but would make the game of baseball a lot fairer. Still 0-2. Remember we showed you this earlier, this uh, this look at Rick Stelmazek hitting a fungo and how difficult it is to see the ball coming out of the roof. You watch it, you see it going up for a while. And now where is it? Little speck. And this is grounded down to short and scooped up by Smith, and he takes care of Gagnon. So the Twins leave another in the fourth, 4-2 St. Louis, and we'll be back after this word from your local station. And between innings, Terry Pendleton trying to convince Whitey he's just fine, and he looks to be fine on the base pass. You never know the difference the way Pendleton has run today. So we go to the fifth. Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer. And Tim McCarver, Smith the batter, and the count 1 and 0. 4 2 St. Louis. Smith, Burr, and Dreesen with Shatz that are working. 1 and 1. The Twins winning the first two at home and then losing three in St. Louis. And the Cardinals trying to do what they did to the Dodgers after they lost the first two in the playoffs a couple of years ago. Lodner. Got a late start on this one and comes back and runs out of room. Shatzeter, by the way, is uh, the only pitcher, and this is quite a distinction. Ozzie Smith, who has very few home runs in his big league career, has hit two of them off Shatzeter. I believe only six lifetime. Mm -hmm. But it's very important for Shatzeter to pitch well, very much what he did in the fourth game when they came back from that 5 0 deficit. And he matches up so well with the Cardinals' running attack. Two and two of the count. They're not going to run on him, but there is not a right-hander in the Twins' bullpen that they will not run on if they get on base. The appropriate runners, of course. And they've got Baron Gare and Reardon, still the men to, to come if, if needed. Two and two of the count. Well, it's fortunate Tom Kelly also has Schatzeter pitching in an American under American League rules because you don't have to pinch hit for him. Because he's such a good hitter, you may not do it may anyway. Not have to but, anyway. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. 253 lifetime. Tom Kelly, very much the symbol of this copacetic ball club. Three and two the count. Kelly, I think more than almost any other manager today, or at least as much, symbolizes the whole mood and the feeling of his ball club. 
with Thousand. I was talking with Peter Gammons of Sports Illustrated and some of the, the media people who've covered series for years and years and talking about the Twins as a group. And I know it sounds trite, but a real good bunch of guys, nice bunch of guys, easy to deal with, mild and mellow of sorts as Ozzie Smith draws the walk and Tommy Hur comes to the plate. And yet the other day after the Twins start the World Series by winning the first two games here, we pick up the, the Minneapolis Star Tribune on Monday. The subhead says winning angry. The headline says snarling ball pounding twins win. Angry, snarling. Who, the headline writer, the managing editor? <laughs> Certainly doesn't fit the players. Boy. I think it. what it did fit was the 10 and 8 runs they put on the board. That's about it, though. Yeah, but it makes it seem as if this is a team of Ulfs and Louts. Tommy Herr, 0 and 1 the count. Smith at first, and nobody out. Fifth inning. 4-2 Cardinals. That's grounded foul. Outside third. And the count 0-2. The Metrodome in Minneapolis. A little quieter at the moment. And our decibel meter, it's a, a very placid 90. Not angry or snarling at the moment. 0 oh, 2 pitch is hit foul out of play. Tell you, Tommy Herr certainly picked a good time to hit his first home run left handed this year. Think about the last three postseason home runs for the Cardinals. Okendo hits his third lifetime home run. Tom Lawless hits his second career home run. And Tommy Herr hits his first left handed home mm -hmm. run of the year. Mm -hmm. And only his third of the year. He had two right handed earlier. Well, they may not hit a lot of home runs, but they certainly surprise you when they do. Smith goes, gets a good jump, and Her hits it foul, so Ozzie comes back. Boy, speed, and it, it's so important. You could start a guy like Smith, 43 stole, stolen bases on the year, two in the playoffs. You have a contact hitter, so even with nobody out, kind of a gutsy play where you have a guy that may strike out, even though he's a contact hitter, and you take you out of the inning, you have a guy that can also steal. If it was a hit and run, I believe it was a run and swing if it's a strike, and he did. Right. Sometimes a base runner like that will guess curveball, too, with the pitcher, and that certainly was a curveball. And that's grounded down to Gagney, and he has one play first base and gets the out there, and Ozzie Smith advances. So with one down, Smith at second, and Danny Dreesen will come to the plate, having grounded out and doubled. It's almost like a sacrifice. You start Smith, Herr gets his bat on the ball, Gagney only has one play, makes a nice play off his front foot, but you got a guy in scoring position to add to your lead, which is already four to two. Now, Pagnazzi, Tom Pagnazzi, the rookie, who can catch and in the World Series DH, and that's what they did in game one. The right hand batting Pagnazzi will come up here to bat for the left hand hitting Dreesen. Now the one thing about Herzog as he tries to take advantage here he's already got Ford out of the game and now he's got Dreesen out of the game and so if the twins could catch up you'd then be in a situation where Whitey would certainly be limited because the twins would go to the the right handers either Baron Gear or Reardon. But Whitey's got to try to get the runs when he can, and he's opted to go with Pagnazzi here with one out and Smith at second base. Well, all the changes he makes, though, he knows that they don't have any more left-handers, so he can put Morris in for defense if he wanted to. I mean, he can make Lindemann at first, and he knows he's not going to get burnt down the road. The one problem you have here is you don't want to use two players. Pagnazzi may be the catcher, Pena to first, Lindemann staying in right. 
Otherwise, you may have to use two players here by having Pagnazzi pinch hit because Greason's out of there. Pagnazzi, to my knowledge, has no major league experience as a first baseman, but is a catcher. Pena has, not, has experience as a first baseman and has been working out at first base in postseason. But we'll see. High in the air to Brunanski. Tom fades on it, has room, makes the catch. Smith tags at second and moves into third as the throw is cut off by Lombardozzi. So two down now. Pagnozzi flying to Brunanski. And Willie McGee will come up right-handed. All of those are plausible moves, but boy, do you hurt your club defensively. Yeah. You I really mean, weaken yourself in three positions. Yeah, we really don't know what we're going uh, what Whitey is going to do as far as Pena is concerned, but that would be the key. If you ever take your starting catcher out of there, you're really weakening yourself defensively, especially if your pitcher's doing well. And Tudor is doing well with the stuff he has. Today. And McGee hits one into right field for a base hit to score another run as Ozzie touches the plate, and the Cardinals now lead by a score of five to two. So the walk to Smith comes back to hurt Jackson. And St. Louis leads by three. And, su and such smart hitting. He sat on deck, on the bench, saw the curveballs, looks for one, hits it to right field, doesn't try to pull. He saw Tommy Hur do that. He saw Pagnazzi fly out to right field on the curveball, saw the pattern of Schatzeter, and then just spanked it to right. I mean, not only did he hit well, he was smart enough to look for the pitch that he's been throwing. Now here's Pendleton batting lefty against lefty. He wants to keep, does Herzog Pendleton in the game, so Terry cannot hit right-handed. We know that. He wants to keep him in the game Think about down the line, he'll waste this at bat here if he has to to keep him available for Reardon or Baron Gear. So he sends him up lefty against lefty. And you wonder the last time that Pendleton faced a lefty left handed. Probably yeah. a little league ball yeah. or something like that. I would think. One and one, certainly. I, I can't imagine this having happened in, in the majors or even the minors unless there was some extraordinary circumstance. In any event, it's something that Terry has not seen very well. Two and one. And in the bullpen, Berenger gets up again for Minnesota. Second time Juan has been warming up. To strike in the count, two and two. I saw Pendleton shake his head. He said, I don't know if he was shaking his head that it wasn't a strike, or he said, I wish I could turn around. I mean, come on. No, no, I don't want to hit this side. <laughs> McGee goes, and Pendleton strikes out. But in the inning, the Cardinals get an insurance run and lead five to two. World Series memory, R. Jackson, number 44 in 1977. And you'll recall this, one of three home runs. Leading the Yankees to the world title. And our man Reggie Roux is here, and we'll be visiting with Reggie on our after the game portion. John Morris comes into to play right field. Jim Lindemann now playing first base. And with Morris now in the game, every eligible player has gotten into the World Series. He's the 48th. Morris and right, bottom of the fifth inning, and Puckett starts things with a base hit in the center field. He's three for three. Well, Rick Rennick, the hitting instructor, third base coach, said when he gets hot, he gets hot. Now look where this ball is. It's down, it's away. And it's a line drive into center. And three for three. So you make a good pitch and uh, didn't turn out too good for John Tudor. As a matter of fact, he's hit three good pitches, two change-ups away, and the fastball at the letters, tight. Gary Gaetti.
Kirby had had four hits in the first five games. He's got three today. John Tudor with a three run lead. Gets it on the black of the plate on the outside on one. Juan Berenguer coming in from the pen. Might come in in the sixth. Might. Bucket at first. Nobody out. It's one and one. The Twins have their players in the game. They're trying to get the crowd back into the game. Because the crowd here can obviously be so affected when they gear it up. They haven't really yet since the second inning. Dietti, as you saw, two for 11 career and 0 for 5 in the series against Tudor. And he hits this one down into the left field corner for extra bases. Coleman has it skip away and then he falls down. Puckett will come in to score on a double. It's five and three. Well, good pitch to hit. Middle of the plate, and Gaetti, as we said, 31 home runs. Likes to get his arms extended and does. You see Vince Coleman fall, so Puckett's going to score. But to me, the important thing about this play, it's a sure double. Coleman doesn't overreact. He does not throw behind the runner and allow Gaetti to go to third base. Mike Roark goes to the mound, and Rick Horton throws in the bullpen. And also Bob Forsh up as well, the right-hander. And I believe he's talking about the bullpen to get into action right there. Didn't take long. John is struggling with his control, and the result is some line drives. Forsh the righty, Horton the lefty. And then when they get deeper into the game, it's Staley and Worrell, as you know. Fifth inning, 5-3 cards. Bale of the tying run at the plate with Gaetti at second. To deep left field, and that one is gone! Hits it in the left for a base hit. Forget the decibel meter, get the Richter scale. Don Baylor's 
first home run as a twin. As that graphic showed you, the last one, a grand slammer, and Boston off Steve Carlton. Not quite as big as this one. A straight change up, too much of the plate. No doubt about it. Yes, sir. 332nd lifetime. Horton in, Tudor out. Rick Horton is on to work. He has not pitched since last Saturday, game one, when he worked the final two innings in a mop-up roll. Here he is with the game tied, 5-5. The Twins with four consecutive hits on six pitches. Ken Herbeck now with Gernanski at first base and nobody out. John Tudor as he departed. Well, nothing like reversing the momentum by having a bad inning when your team has just scored a run to go ahead five to two and that's what John was really what, what he able to do but that's what he did. And Ricky Horton's asked to put a finger in the dike. Go ahead, run to first base. Bernanski, nobody out in the bottom of the fifth inning. The center field to a deep McGee, but he comes in and makes the play. One gone, and Laudner the batter as Bernanski retreats. The last huge home run that Baylor hit would be a year ago in the American League Championship Series with the Angels leading three games to one and leading in the fifth game, five to two at Anaheim. You'll recall that Baylor came up and hit a two-run homer to make it 5-4, and then with two out and two strikes, it was Dave Henderson hitting the home run. Red Sox went on to win the game, and the next two, and the pennant. 0-1 the count on Laudner. And very similar that it was a high curveball off width that he went out off the plate and yanked it into the left field stands. This was a change that maybe not off the plate, but it's a pitch that a normal hitter may single on Baylor, as we said, well over 300 home runs. Whacked it into the left field seats to tie up this game. Runner goes, and it's a comebacker to Horton, and he looks at second, then goes to first for the out. Two down. And it will bring up Lombardozzi. Tudor's reaction following Baylor's home run. said that you have to yell to talk to somebody next to you on the bench. Now you know why we're yelling. 2 and 0. This is not the best matchup if you're Whitey Herzog and you're bringing in Horton following Tudor. You'd like to have Forrest or a right-hander come in. That's a different contrast as far as styles. Except Forrest struggled so much back in that fourth game that you wonder he went with Horton because of the confidence level. Strike and it's two and one on Lombardozzi. Well to repeat what we said the other night left handers are more effective against right handed hitters than right handed pitchers are against left handed hitters. So with the left handed you don't really lose a lot. Both Bernanski and Gaetti for instance hit right handed pitching better than left handers. Deck. 
Vlad in the top of the order. Watching Lombardozzi, the number nine hitter. Two down, Bernanski to his lead at second. Line drive, base hit in the center field. Here comes McGee, here comes Bernanski, here comes the throw, he's safe! Take another look now. Well, here Lombardozzi went up with Reniak, batting coach in Boston. Hitting instruction, McGee does not make a good throw. You can see Tony have to go to his right, as Timmy said. When he gets back, Bernansk is already across the plate. See, actually, Tony set up properly, expecting the throw slightly to the left of home plate, and then the throw was slightly to the right of home plate. And that's why Bernanski scored. One and two on Black. Catchers are trained to keep the left leg, the weight on the left leg. It's the toughest play on a throw from right field. The next toughest play is on the throw from center because the runner comes in blindly. The easiest play is on the throw coming from left field. Time. Time called. 6-5 Minnesota with four here in the fifth. Lombardozzi at first, two down, one and two on Gladden. Soft little looper to Smith, and that's that. But eight men come to the plate. They get four. The place erupts at 6-5 Quinn. Pena sets up properly, but watch what the throw does to him. It takes him out of his position to the right of home plate, and that allows Brunanski to bull through that left leg. Had he had the weight on the left leg, that wouldn't have happened. You ward him off. Another view, and you can see Terry Tater right there, the umpire, to make the call. Brunanski gets his knee as Pena tags him, I think that's what Whitey came out and argued about. Did he get to the plate before he tagged him? Tata said yes. End of story. Now, here's Baron Gare into work with Lindemann batting. The Cardinal lineup right now, recall, with the two switches. Lindemann is in the seven spot. Morris is in the game. He's in the four spot with Baron Gare working. They've already spent Ford, and they've already spent Dreesen, and they've already spent Pagnazzi from the bench. And that is the key as far as I'm concerned in the Cardinals to Juan Berenguer pitching well. He's come in, he, threw, he throws well over 90 miles per hour, but they saw him pitch last year with San Francisco. They all know he throws 90 miles per hour, but they all say you'll get a good fastball to hit every time. He did not get his breaking ball over the other night. Lindemann hits a ground ball to second. Lombard does, he throws him out. So he comes in with two sliders and then a fork ball. And this is not the Baron Garrett that we saw the other night with the one nothing lead in the third ball game that came in and gave up three runs almost all on high breaking balls or fastballs when he got behind in the count. 
Okendo now. What Kelly is thinking is, hey, Juan, get me to the eighth. Get me to the eighth inning. Well, he got the tune-up with Jeff Reardon, their stopper in game five. Even though they were behind, he pitched very well as he did all year, at least the last three quarters of the year after struggling early. So you're right, that's what he needs, a couple of innings. 2-0. Oh. Well, that's that high strike you just do not get with a National League umpire. Terry Taylor down on one knee. Used to be a strike, not anymore. Two and one. You don't get it from the American League umpire that much anymore either. Occasionally, no. though. Yeah. But not very often, you're right. That strike zone has really dropped. And there should be consistency between the two leagues. And there is. Uh, they went the from that part, outside yeah. protector to the yeah. inside. Two and two. And there's the two one four call. So if Aaron Gare, as we said, you got to show the hitter a difference in speeds of pitches and types of pitches, and he's done that to the first two batters so far. Woo. Three and two. His weakness is wildness. Timmy, you had that stat where what he threw 113 pitches in three and two thirds innings, right. and didn't lose or win. Got a no decision a up no in decision. Boston. Only a six to five game. That's grounded down a short on a fourth ball, and there are two down, two away here in the sixth inning. Pena coming up. What a view from behind the plate. A three-two fourth ball. You can see it plummet, tumble. Okenda hits the top half of it. Ground ball to shortstop. I just figured out a way to make a million dollars. We'll go out and get the exclusive on a throat lozenge concession in Minneapolis. <laughs> this crowd is unbelievable. Pena with two out. Takes a strike. Well, it's such an obvious difference when you play in your home park. You get down five to two and you're in St. Louis, there's no noise. You're down five to two here, at least you have somebody cheering, giving you a little bit of momentum so to speak seemed to work one and one on Pena two out sixth inning six to five twins and that's grounded toward the middle good stop by Gagney guns him down It's Minnesota 6, St. Louis 5. You know, we're only in the sixth inning here, but assume the Twins win and we go to a seventh game. Minnesota has Viola. St. Louis has McGrain. Cox on two days rest. What do you think? Big advantage Twins. That's what I said. Definitely, I think Viola learned a lot from uh, the last start. And McGrain, I mean, you'd like to think at, at 23, intelligent young man, but I got to give the edge to anybody that has to comes in here. He does not have any advantage at all because who knows what the Cardinal pitchers are going to do. They have not pitched well here. Rick Horton on in relief. He faces Greg Gagne in the bottom of the sixth inning. Gagne, Puckett, and Gaetti. Let's watch Gagne in the top of the sixth. Footwork is so important to a middle infielder in particular. Watch the feet of Gagne. Trust me, it's important. <laughs> We believe it. The positioning of the rearranging of the position of the feet very very important. That allows middle infielders to get off the strong throws that you see. A lot of times you see the results. You don't know how they started. Strike to Gagney. Two and one. Gagney has hit three ground balls today for outs. Three and one. Cardinals still have four throwing in the pen. Here's Bob. Little chopper off the plate. Going to be tough for Ozzie. Leaps, throws. No. Normally, if there's a will, there's a way, but ha, there was the will, and you'll see it right here. We we'll always refer to him as an acrobat, and then again, but Gagney with good speed and the high hop, base hit. 
Pretty good 3-1 pitch down in the strike zone, and I guess being from Baltimore, we can call this the Baltimore chop, and it was. But watch this. It's just yeah. amazing. I'll tell you, if you folks don't think this is a difficult play, try it. Write yeah. it down. And then go catch, catch the ball and throw it before you land. And then go right to your chiropractor. <laughs> Here comes Forsh. Happy trails to you. Here is Bob Forsh on in relief. He's appeared in two games, and he was the winning pitcher with a lot of help from his friends the other night, some defensive gems behind him. Well, that and his control is very erratic. I talked to him. He said, I have no idea. Of those 33 games, he started 30 of them. As you said, Ali did get the win, but uh, great defense by a double play by Ozzie Smith twice and a line drive out to left field that Coleman made a great play on. And for him to be effective, he has to have good control. <laughs> the, that's great fella, signs here. Fellow right behind home plate. I'm telling you, he has got a sign ready for every occasion. Let's get the inside pitch on longtime Cardinal Bob Horst. pitcher. He knows how to pitch. He mixes his pitches well. He throws a fastball, curveball, slider, and straight change, and he doesn't give in to the hitter. Uh, he's always around the plate. And he's tough to steal on. He's real quick going to the plate, which is going to make it tough for Twins runners to try to steal a base. I think the key to Tony's report, and again, Tony and Paul have been right on with their reports throughout the series. I think the key is that he doesn't give in to the hitter. And that was our point the other night. He tries to get ahead of you and then get you out with pitches off the plate. Kirby Puckett who was four for 20 in the first five games. But today, three for three, he has scored twice, he has driven in a run, and he has stolen a base. Forrest with Gagne at first base and nobody out. All one. As we said, when he gets hot, he gets torrid. Six hits, six for six, and Milwaukee and then four hits the next night. Ten hits in two games. Tony Oliva said it doesn't matter what you throw up there. Breaking ball, fastball in, fastball away, change-ups, will get his hits. That's how you hit 332. Two and nothing. I'll tell you it didn't matter what you threw to Tony Oliva either, did it, Jim? No, three batting championships. Wow. Amazing hitter and hit the ball where he's pitched. So he's very much like Kirby Puckett. One year over 30 home runs for Tony Oliva. Tony won his second batting title in 1965, the last time the Twins were in the World Series. And the only time the Twins were in the World yeah. Series prior to this. So Force really takes off where he left off the other night. And as Tony Gwynn said, he's experienced. He has to be around the plate. And he can't give in to you because he does not have overpowering stuff. He never really has. Has to be on the edges. Has to get ahead in the counts three and zero. Oh. He has to come to you if, as a hitter. You're going to be in the driver's seat. Yeah, and because Bob doesn't throw as hard as he used to, when he falls behind, it's it's doubly in the hitter's advantage or to the hitter's advantage. Well, that, is that a big difference? Yeah. My goodness. 3-0 is ball four, first and second. Mike Rourke. He's sending Pagnazzi, who was out of the game, of course. He was a pinch hitter, but is still working as the bullpen catcher. Lee Tunnel is already down in the pan, and they're going to get Daly up as well. The lefty. You're almost looking four hitters down the lineup to when Herbeck comes up, but Whitey knows he cannot afford to let this game get away. Does not want to play tomorrow. Uh -uh. Gary Gaetti, a big fifth inning double to get the Twins rolling. 0-1.
You know, Gaetti's the kind of guy, if you're a baseball fan and you don't really follow the Twins, you hear his name, you know he's a pretty good player, and then you get to watch him every day, as you do during the playoffs in the World Series, and he really grows on you. Well, he is a good player. And you really see it when you watch him day after day after day. 0 oh and 2. And you say, why is he a good player? He's probably going to win his second gold glove. Hit over 30 home runs. He really came down about 20 some points in average this year. But he last year hit over 280, this year around 260. He can hit the ball the other way. Pretty good speed. Used to play shortstop in college. A free agent. Any general managers listening? <laughs> or watching? Oh, Most of them are here. Yeah. That's right. Nobody out. We're at the bottom of the sixth inning in game six. The Twins trying to stay alive, and they lead the Cardinals six to five. Gagne at second and Puckett at first. Nobody out. Out of play. Boy, did he get away with a mistake there. High slider, pull foul. The good thing for if you're Bob Forsh is that even though you are in a jam, Gaetti is not going to be bunting. You're not going to be playing for one run. So if you can make your pitch, and Forsh is a sinker baller, or more effective down the strike zone, you, you got the double, you have the double play in order. Now watch this. 0 and 2 pitch. We said Pena's sitting down and away, and look at that high slider, but it was too high. Right. One of those pitches you can't take, but tough to put in play. A lot of people think that if a breaking ball is up, that it's automatically a hanger and that it's easy to hit. Some breaking balls are too high, but the, the, the high breaking ball is really right around the waist. The ball that breaks around the letters, regardless of how effective it is or how hard it's thrown, is usually too high to do anything with. That's what happened then. 0 oh 2 the count. Nobody out. And that's off Pena's glove. So that eliminates the double play. There he goes after this ball like he was crossed up. Usually when catchers aren't quick, Upstairs, it looks like. Watch the mitt, right? See, it looks like he's looking for something to break into an area, and then kind of made a wild stab at the fastball. Ruled a pass ball. It should have been. Yep. Now the Cardinal infield sets up a little deep, but they may begin to cheat in, and they start to already. Does Ozzy anyway? It should. The second and third and nobody out. <laughs> Reaches out, fouls it off. Morris gives chase, but well back out of play. One and two. And another good quality is plate coverage. Of course, made the pitch he wanted to make there, and Gaetti, again, didn't have a good swing at it, but he did create a situation where he's going to get another pitch to hit. The good hitters fight those pitches off and foul them, and the bad hitters, the 250 hitters, put those balls in play. One two pitch. Check two and two. Appeal? No. Gagney at third. Pocket at second. Popped up. Smith and her both go out. It's Ozzie underneath it, and he has it for the first down and a big out. 
One away. Now Baylor, and now they've got to think about, as you look at Baylor's home run on tape, about maybe walking Baylor to try to set up a DP with Brunansky. We'll see. Here it was in the fifth inning to tie the game. I'll tell you, I'd pitch to him right here. But they're not. They're going to walk him. I mean, would you rather pitch to a regular player, a guy who plays 160 games a year, or Don Baylor, who has batted 50 times in the last six weeks? 50, his first home run. I can tell you, after never throwing a grand slam in almost 4,000 innings, that I don't want to load him up. And the reason I say that is because I don't think one run is going to beat you here. I know what Whitey's saying. Let's load him up, and we'll go for the double play. And Forsh is supposed to be a sinker baller. He got that ball down to Gaetti, but he didn't he hit a grounder. It's a big gamble. Bernanski, as you said, has played all year long. I think I, think I, I agree with you, Tim. I think I, I would have pitched to him because I'm a, if I'm the manager, I'm afraid, or let's say Bernanski strikes out or pops out. Now I've got to go to get Daly to face Herbeck to get that third out of the inning. And I'm not sure I want to use Daly in the sixth. Yep. Anyway, mull it over. It's certainly not a clear choice. No. Plus, there's no place to put Bernanski. That's right. That makes a big difference. He hits it in the air to shallow center field. Gagne is tagging. Smith is going out. And he makes the catch. And the throw is cut off. It was deep enough so that there was no infield fly rule in effect. And two down as Bernanski pops out. Now you've got Herbeck. And now you've got Herzog going out. And now you're going to have Daly coming in here. So this is what Whitey's opted for. Well, went right after him, and that's what you do with the bases loaded. And pops it up. So that's a low fastball for a pop-up from Gaetti and a high pop, pop fly on a high fastball from Brunanski. So here comes Daly to try to get Herbeck with the bases loaded and two out in the sixth. Some pretty fascinating stuff going on here right now because Daly comes out of the bullpen, bases loaded, two out to try to keep the Cardinals very much in the game to face Herbeck. He's the specialist. He normally comes in later than this, but Herzog, in a way, maybe feeling the game is partially on the line here. He's got to get out of this inning and stay within one, so he's got to go to Daly early. Yeah, game situations can come in the first inning, the fifth inning, or the ninth inning, and this is a game situation. So Daly, the fourth Cardinal pitcher, they have Tunnel, a righty in the bullpen. Bases loaded, two out, bottom of the sixth. Twins lead by one. And Herbeck, it's a high drive to deep center field. McGee goes back, grand slam! from your local station. Another World Series record tied. Yogi Berra and Moose Gowran in 56 at two. Gladden did it in game one. Here's Herbeck with natural sound hitting it out. Can one swing a race?
makes you forget not running that double out or getting picked off second, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> That's, really right. Does. That's right. Seventh inning. Coleman, the top of the order, takes a strike. 0 and 1. One pitch from Daly. 10 5. Minnesota in the seventh inning. Baron Gear now throws another strike. 0 and 2. Well, you never look, like to give up a home run, a, a key base hit, and that's certainly one was, but one was one. But I'll tell you what, Daly came in with his best, and Herbert was better. Went with his number one fastball. One out. Ken Daly. Some days you do, and some days you don't. I'll tell you, it's a lot better than making a bad pitch and having hit it. You just went right after him and hit it over the center field fence. Mr. Herzog. And thinking a little bit about tomorrow, even though the Cardinals still have eight outs to go. One and oh on Ozzie Smith. And he hits it into right field off the hands for a base hit. First hit of the game for Smith. And the first hit off Berenger. And Tommy Herr is the batter. Herr one for three. Darryl Strawberry was the last left-handed batter to Homer off Ken Daly two years ago. And that was an 11 inning one to nothing ball game. And it was a high curveball. And Ken Herbeck hits the 14th Grand Slam in World Series history. Tommy Herr tries to bunt his way on strike. 0 and 1. And also the first hit for Herbeck against left handers in the World Series. He's now 1 for 17. But oh, what a one. <laughs> and people wondering, the Twins fans, Herbeck Puckett, when would they wake up? Hello? <laughs> Puckett is three for three plus a walk. One and one. <laughs> Outside. Signs like that adorn this beautiful city. Who is they? They said it couldn't be done. They turn up everywhere. I remember John yeah. Lowenstein, one of my teammates. He says, "Who is they?" Well, you saw downtown Minneapolis framing the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome, and inside before 55,293. That's the attendance today. Herbeck, Bernanski, Gaetti, Puckett, they call them the Fab Four up here. Maybe that's who they are. <laughs> one and one account. And now it's two and one. The dome. What did Dave Anderson call it in the New York Times yesterday? The decibel dome. <laughs> Two one pitch is grounded to the right side, and that's a base hit. Ozzy Smith will hold at second, and so the Cardinals are very much still alive and kicking. Two on with one out, and John Morris is the batter, and it's the first time that he has come up. In the World Series, see the last of the 48 of the two clubs to get in. Morris, we mentioned it the other night, grew up on Long Island in Belmore and knew a couple of the twins, Frank Viola, and he knew Gene Larkin. He met Gene Larkin when they were in the fourth, fifth grade. Gene Larkin's birthday today, as a right. matter of fact, he's 25 years old. Morris takes inside ball one. Now with Whitey having made the moves before Morris comes up here hitting out of the cleanup spot. A spot in which Dreesen started then Pagnazzi hit for him and now Morris in the four slot with McGee on deck. 
Breaks his bat, one hopper. Lombardozzi to Gagne, to Herbeck, double play. At the end of six and a half, 10-5 Twins. The only other World Series in which the Twins played game six, the sixth inning, Howie Reed on the mound, Mudcat Grant. It's a three-run homer to give the Twins a 5 nothing edge. And I've got an interesting story once this inning begins. I guess I could complete it right now. Mudcat Grant's mother's name is Viola. And he will be the starting pitcher Ooh. tomorrow night if the Twins win this evening. Like it. Meanwhile, Lee Tunnel comes in for St. Louis to face Steve Lombardozzi. Now here's what Whitey's managing both games right now. He's managing this one and he's managing the Warren Ice game. He had Daly in the game, but he has to get Daly out down by five. He's going to need Daly tomorrow night. So he's got to go to Tunnel right now to make sure Daly is fresh tomorrow. And it's hit in the air to right and right to Morris. One gun. First time they've gotten the man they call Lombo today. Well, it goes back to the point you made two innings ago when you walk Baylor to load up the bases, you get Bernanski to pop up, but you, as a manager, make yourself bring in Daly. Now, I'm not second-guessing that because I know Whitey would do the same thing tomorrow, and the result might be different, but what you do do is make you bring Daly in earlier, and now we see Tunnel because you are managing for tomorrow. Well, the great thing, one of the great things about this game is you mow over all this stuff. There's no black and white answer. If there's a black and white answer to everything, it wouldn't be it's right. the fun it is. Wouldn't have the charm yeah. that it does. I'll so tell true. you what is black and white. 10, 8, and 10 runs for the Twins mm -hmm. when they play here in five and three games in Bush Stadium. Mm -hmm. That's driven to right, and Morris is there fading on it. Two down. And Gagne will be the batter. A reminder, they're coming up on Monday night. The regulars are back. And Monday Night Football at 9 Eastern Time will feature the Los Angeles Rams against the Cleveland Browns. Rams trying to get healthy. And also, if we go to a, a seventh game of the World Series, they're going to play the Bronco Viking game on Monday night, and we'll have coverage of that in selected areas for you. Want to know the count on Gagne. Two out, base is empty. Ten five twins. Strike. One and one. Tunnel pitch in the second game. Pitched fairly well. He hit the looper to Gagne to, to really kind of bury them, but then and then the other than that, the home run to Laudner over the center field fence. Tommy Hur with a nice backhand stop and throw, and that's that as they get Gagne and Tunnel has a one, two, three inning. On to the eighth. Ten five twins. Eighth inning in the Rock and <laughs> Well, Elvis will be leaving the building shortly. Letterman calls up, gets me on the phone, and he's got some selected home run calls he wanted to hear. That was one of them. Instead of, you know, it's gone or she's out of here, we're supposed to say when a ball leaves, Elvis will be leaving the building <laughs> shortly, or Elvis has left the building. Well, Elvis left the building when Herbeck cranked one into the seats. No question about that. McGee starts the eighth inning. McGee and then Pendleton to follow. And Juan Berenguer trying to wrap this one up. Ten to five. You know, Kelly has to think about something here, too. He's got a five-run lead. He's got Baron Gear who's worked two innings, and he's got tomorrow, he hopes. Does he want to have Reardon pitch an inning today and maybe be a little sharper? Does he want to bring Baron Gear out? Because if Baron Gear, let's say, were to go all the way, if he worked four innings today, he might be limited tomorrow. So he's got that thing to mull over right now. What do you think, Jim? I think one inning. You think one inning for Reardon? Yeah, but we, going back to that story he told us about trying to Get that kid in the minor league some innings when the score was nine to nothing and when it ended nine to eight. 
He's got to manage for today. But I, as far part part of managing for today is to get reared in an inning so he'll be sharp. And then you do have Baron Garrett who pitched in four out of the five playoff games. As you look at Jeff Reardon, he's looking down there. Yeah, he yeah. hears us or he's yep. looking for a, I, a I, message. I think he'd, he'd like an inning. McGee fouls it back. Remember, he had yesterday off, and there's Viola who will pitch tomorrow. But Reardon has uh, not worked very much in this series. He did not work in game one. He worked one inning in game two. He did not pitch in three. He didn't pitch in four, and he's getting ready. <laughs> and he worked a couple of innings, uh, an inning and a fraction in five. I think you do it as much as you said. You do it as much for Reardon as you do, or Baron Gare as much as you do Reardon. You really compliment both pitchers. If indeed that's Kelly's idea about bringing Reardon in in the ninth inning. Two and two the count. Well, what's impressed me so much about Juan Baron Gare, a couple of tough outings. You know, everybody kind of blamed Tom Kelly along with Juan for squandering that one nothing lead. That's pretty easy to do with the three runs back in game three but he's really adjusted he's used his breaking pitch and you learn from your mistakes and this is one guy that has three and two on Willie McGee Worrell and the good Dr. London the rest of the Cardinals I don't think Tom Kelly wants to bring in Reardon by necessity he would want to bring him in to give him an innings worth of work. He doesn't want mm -hmm. to bring him in exactly. to a tight situation. There's a big difference. Exactly. Herbeck. One out. Pendleton coming up. Yeah, you asked any reliever and they want to come in to start the inning if they have a choice. Now obviously they don't on many occasions. We mentioned Viola definitely tomorrow. Look, what Whitey said before the game was this. He said, I'm, I'm thinking about McGrain, who pitched in game one. The other day he had mentioned Cox on two days rest, but he said, I'm thinking about McGrain. I'm going to talk to Cox. So it will be one of the two. If it's Cox, he's going on two days rest. As Pendleton hurts himself on that swing, you can tell that Terry is in a little bit of agony. Remember, he's got that rib damage. And so while he shakes it off, the count is 0-1. But Whitey's got McGrain, who has not pitched since game one, at least it started since game one. And Cox on two days rest. Matthews, but Matthews has come out of two postseason games with that quadricep injury, so it can't be him. Or it doesn't figure to be. Whitey has said he would be very, very unlikely to get into another ball game. Mm -hmm. Greg Matthews, that is. So what he does is he starts to look backwards, and optimally for Whitey, he says, let me see. I get two or maybe three out of Orell. If Daly can give me one or two, I got to get me somebody to give me five. And that's where the problem <laughs> arises. Well, on the stat sheet, you know, throughout that you go into a major league clubhouse, and it has all of the averages of the players. And then there's another category that says others down at the bottom. That's for the players that have been farmed out, uh, brought up, and a conglomerate average for all of those that have been there. Tomorrow, it's others for right. both teams. Others. All others. Yeah. That's foul back. And it's two and two. It'd be interesting if they start Joe McGrain. He really did not pitch that poorly. The line, the line score shows that he gave up four or five runs, but eight days between starts. Not the best circumstances, even though he's thrown on the side, but that's not like pitching in a ball game. Still two and two on Terry Pendleton. There is no question that if the Twins win this game, they have a much more stable pitching situation for a lot of reasons. They're going with their ace, Frank Viola. They have a rested bullpen for the most part Reardon certainly their stopper you got a guy who can go six or seven innings and Reardon healthy Shatzeter relatively rested 
Line to right field deep. Bernanski goes back and plays it off the trash bag and holds him to a single. Tom Bernanski owns the canvas out there. And well, he should. He's been playing here since the ballpark opened. Pendleton said he likes to look for a fastball off of Baron Guerra, and this is what it comes down to. He gets one and then just smashes it to right. But down by five runs, and having seen Bernanski play the trash bag out there, he'll stay right at first. It's like really Yaz playing the left field wall. People that are really adept playing a certain ballpark. Lindemann, 1 0. Oh. There's Reardon now, beginning to throw in the pen. You know, one thing about Brunanski, if he ever takes up highlight, I want him and Mike Winella. 2 0 oh the count. You imagine someone trying to pick up the game. They've heard all these terms. And now, finally, you hear about an outfielder playing the trash bag. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Make you want to give up the game of baseball. I've heard everything. <laughs> Three and up. Oh. <laughs> that Bernanski, 30 years from now, telling telling his grandkids nobody could play a trash bag <laughs> like I did. Dick Such is going to go out to the mound now with a count three and zero. Oh. Dick Such is a guy who knows a little bit about pitching. He was a, a minor league pitcher for the most part, and in one particular season, Dick Such was 0 and 16, and his earned run average was 2.81. There it is. In 1967, York, Pennsylvania, in the Eastern League, he was 0 and 16 with a 2.81 ERA. And do you know what? He got called up by the parent club at the end of the season. Didn't pitch though. Only a parent would call you up. Yeah, the, the, that parent club was the the second edition of the Washington Senators, not the ones that are now the Minnesota Twins, the ones that are now the Texas Rangers. And he said, as Lindemann stands in with a count of three and zero, oh, ready to take a pitch here. Such said on the last day of the year, he's 0 15. He has a one run lead, two out of the ninth inning, and the second baseman made an error to allow two runs to score. But you wouldn't be talking about it if he hadn't done that. That's right. <laughs> In the air to shallow right. Bernanski calls Lombardozzi off and makes the play. Two down. And much more impressive to be 0 and 16 than 1 and 15. Bob Miller of the original New York Mets won a game on the last day of the season to make his record 1 and 12 mm, right back in 1962. Tom Bob. Lawless got a hit on the last day of this season. Yeah. They get his second hit of the year. <laughs> Tom Lawless. And then there's Okendo who's one for two. It'll be interesting to see if this game does there is play tomorrow. Will Viola pitch around Lawless? Two out. There's Tom. One one count. Pendleton goes. It's low, and they just give him second base. So Terry, despite the, the rip problems, has two steals today and was going on another pitch at one point. Hanging out a sign for Whitey, he wants to play tomorrow. One and two. And he might if a right-hander were pitching. He can throw, he can hit from the left side. But I don't think Whitey wants to match up Viola against Pendleton hitting left handed. Oh. 
in the air to center. If Newton was right, this baby will plop into the glove of Puckett. And Sir Isaac, you never fail us. At the end of seven and a half, 10-5, Minnesota. Back in Minnesota, Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver, game six. First six games of series, each won by the home team. Dodgers in 55, they went on to win. Yankees 56, they did. Dodgers 65, they did. And Pirates against Baltimore in 71, James. You were in that series? Yes, I was. We were, well, in fact, the whole team was in the series till Steve Blass came to the mound and beat us 2-1 to one on the, on the fi uh, final mm -hmm. game of the World Series that year. At Baltimore. Yes. So now Puckett to start things in the bottom of the eighth inning. Gaetti and Baylor to follow. Lee Tunnel in relief. 10-5 Twins. Cardinals in the ninth. As you look at Straker, who started this game for Minnesota, the Cardinals have 8-9 and 1, Okendo, Pena, and Coleman. One and one. In 1955, when that first happened, that was the game Johnny Padres shut out the Yankees two to nothing in game seven at Yankee Stadium. The catch in the eighth inning by Sandy Amaros. Mm -hmm. Right at the line. Two and one. Mr. Baylor. And don't forget, Mr. Baylor, on Mr. Herbeck's day was the guy who tied the game for the two run blast in the fifth. Three and one. Kirby trying to keep a perfect day alive. Three singles and a walk. Three and two. Take a look at some college scores. Grounded through the middle. Her knocks it down, has no play. Carl Polat, the owner of the Minnesota Twins, has just watched Kirby Puckett get his fourth hit. It's an infield single, four for four plus a walk. The ball appeared to hit the seam, and we saw the other night the ball on Ken Herbeck that Vince Coleman went to first base. The ball hit the seam to start off that inning for the Cardinals. In game five. Infield hit for Puckett. Gaetti now. One and the count. That's what makes it so difficult on the turf. A lot of times you hear people say the ball does speed up. It doesn't speed up. It just doesn't slow down any. So even though you get to the ball, instead of getting it in the pocket, you get it in the heel of the glove. And as you said, when it has a regular bounce because it is hitting the seam, it makes the play even harder. 2-0, a seventh game tomorrow night at 8 Eastern time. And don't forget, we get an extra hour of sleep as we go back to standard time. So if he starts Danny Cox, the good news for Herzog is he has two days and one extra hour's rest. You'll take it where you can find it, That's right? That's right. That's right. Timmy, I don't know about you, but the only pitcher that I ever pitched with that ever pitched on two days rest was Mike Quayer and he was a you know, more or less a well, hard thrower when he first came up but a junk baller could change speed so well Cox really is not that type of pitcher. I don't think so even though he doesn't rely on the fastball of course the well chronicled last three weeks of the 1964 season for the Philadelphia Phillies when Jim Bunning and Chris Short managed mm -hmm. by Gene Mock went on two days rest quite a bit. Gene's still living that down that season down and that is a real shame in my opinion. Oh yeah. What a truly terrific manager. 
to center field. McGee got a late read on it, but now he gauges it. One down, and Don Baylor is the batter. You know, an interesting thing, Tim, that you brought up in regard to, to Mock, and I was thinking of his nephew, Roy Smalley, of the Twins. Roy's dad played for about 11 years in the big leagues, and, and Uncle Gene has not gotten to a World Series. And Roy, as you take a look at Randy Bush coming up to hit for Baylor, Roy Jr. finally makes it into the series this year, so a long, long time for the Smalley clan. And Roy Jr. will be 35 tomorrow. Here's Bush. Randy takes outside, ball one. That's grounded off the glove of Lindemann into right field, and Puckett will go to third. So Randy Bush comes off the bench to put runners at first and third with one out and bring up Bernanski. Most likely will be an error, but this ball is nailed. You can see him holding the runner, talking about Jim Lindemann. Has to backhand it because he doesn't have any time to play it any other way. Right fielder used to play third base. Pretty close down at first base. Especially. I'll tell you what's really interesting, the fact that Randy Bush pinch hit then. Don Baylor was the right-handed hitter when the Twins were only up by one in the sixth inning mm -hmm. right. against a right-hander. But, but I'll tell you why, because all year long, everybody's talked about Tom Kelly using everybody, and I think what he wanted to do, even though Baylor with a two-run home run, he wanted to get him another at bat in case he has to face Cox tomorrow. Do, do you think that Tom Kelly knew that Whitey Herzog would walk Baylor anyway? Good question. That's grounded fair, knocked down by Okendo and picked up, throws, and gets him on a wonderful play, but the Twins get another run as Puckett crosses the plate. So Bernanski grounds out but gets an RBI, two down, and it's 11 to 5. Oh, no idea about that, but I think Baylor would have hit then as you take another look at that play. Well, Kendall, as Timmy said, is a great shortstop when he gets a chance to play, and you can see why. Great range, and now you see the arm, even though it's been bothering him. Not too many third basemen even get to that. Here you see the tail end of the, of the play on the good throw and the good stretch by Lindemann. Now they will walk her back intentionally. The last time he came up, there was no place to put Herbeck on with the bases loaded. But with the opportunity here not to pitch to him and take their chances with Laudner instead, they walk him to put runners at first and second. On Bush's ball, by the way, it's ruled an error on Lindemann. And we can tell you this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball including Ken Herbeck's household where it might be replayed a few times through the years. Herbeck and here it was again in the sixth. And that made the score nine to five. And right now Herbeck at first with Laudner at the plate and a half swing strike. Bush at second, Herbeck at first, two down in the eighth inning, 11 to five twins. Say if, if the nose, ear, and throat doctors in this town don't do big business next week, I give up. Between the larynxes and the ringing eardrums, wow. Mm. Smith to her, but the Twins get another run. It's unearned. To the ninth, 11-5, Minnesota in game six. Things happening these days. The playoffs are so exciting. It takes the World Series a little time to build, and early on in this series, 
there didn't appear to be that much interest. And then all of a sudden, we're three outs away from a seventh game, and it's a very interesting series. With, with the exception of, of the series starting here, as a matter of fact, what's a good story? It has a good beginning, middle, and end. This is going to end like it began, very mm. noisily. Huh? <laughs> well, I'm sure the cards don't. <laughs> want that to happen. It's going to end noisily, oh, yes, regardless, noisily yes. regardless of whether the Twins win or lose. Ninth inning, Jeff Reardon has come in. So Kelly does opt, as we suspected before, to, to give Reardon an inning in as much as he has not been that active and he will be fresher in Tom's mind tomorrow if needed. He faces Pena, and the count on Pena is one and one. Pena, Coleman, and Smith in the ninth. Baron Gare worked three, meaning tomorrow night he probably could get maybe two innings out of him. By the way, he pitched in the playoffs. He might want to get the ball to start. <laughs> four out of five games. But outstanding job, and he changes pattern. And speaking of patterns, this guy has so many options. I really didn't have a chance Tim, to see him pitch that much as you look at Kirby Puck four for four run four runs scored. Regeru. A lot easier to score four runs when you hit three home runs. Than I assume it's in that ball game. I do too. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. Two and two. Goose Goslin of the Washington Senators. 1924. That's the only world championship this franchise has won. And that's hit over Gagne's head in the center for a base hit. So Pena is on. A leadoff single in the ninth inning. And Vince Coleman comes up. Battling a case of the flu and 0 for 4. Vince is now 4 for 23 in the series. I'll tell you, I know this sounds a little strange, but even if the Cardinals don't catch the, the Twins, they would like to see Reardon pitch a lot, throw a lot of pitches and to have them possibly score three runs. Give them something to think about. Not only doing that, do you do you make a battle out of it and give them a finish, but you get reared and throwing a lot of pitches and spoil the strategy of Tom Kelly. Broken bat, little squibber up the middle, and a nice play by Lombardozzi to cross the bag and then come back and get Pena, four unassisted. One away here in the ninth inning. Well, such a good play. Number one, he catches the ball. We saw what could happen in St. Louis when the ball hits the dirt. Doesn't think about two. Of course, Coleman's running, but gets the sure out with an 11-5 lead. That's what you want to do. Gagne backs him up just in case something happens to keep the runner from going to third. But nice play. So one out. And to our crew, our thanks for the job today, led by Kurt Gowdy, Jr., our producer, and Craig Janoff, our director. Not only today, but all six games. They've been fabulous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Smith hits it in the air to right field, and Grunanski goes back to the base of the fence and has it. Second long out for Ozzie Smith, and the crowd will build. They're an out away from sending it to seven. Here's her. If you are wondering about the decibel meter we showed you earlier, that baby is broken. Herbeck's home run rendered it inoperative. Gonzo, out of here. Two out of the night. One and one on Tommy Herr. I think the crowd is pacing itself. I really do. Like we're, yeah. They know they've got one more night. So there are little lulls here and there just uh -huh. to rest the vocal cords.
Smalley and Baylor. Runner goes and a base hit into right field with Lombardozzi going over to cover second. And that was sort of odd because what they were really doing is letting Coleman have free reign. The throw right. wasn't going to go through anyway. And then Lombardozzi goes over and Kelly's angry because if Lombardozzi had stayed where he should have stayed, this game would be over. Certainly he would have had a play. And you're exactly right. With the playing behind Vince Coleman, you're going to give him second anyway. And that's the reason. At Kelly is upset. Watch Lombardozzi in the top of your screen. You do that out of habit, but a case can be made that the ball game's over had he stayed in his position. Mm -hmm. Of course, you'd rather have him. Excuse me. I'd rather have him do it in an 11-5 game yeah. and learn yeah. from it than have it happen tomorrow night. If it were a close game, though, they'd be holding him on. That's true. But then there'd be a reason to cover. Yeah. Right. 0 oh, and 1 the count on Morris with two out and two out in the ninth. And Minnesota leading 11 5. And that's the most emotion we've seen from Tom Kelly. And, and, and again, that's not putting, I mean, it sounds like or looks like it may be putting down a second baseman, but he'll learn from it. And I'm sure he'll talk to him. And it's not going to happen again. That's what baseball is all about living, learning, failing, succeeding. Runner goes, uncontested steal, and a strike, and they give Tommy her second base. It's a pretty good idea of why you need to blow out the Cardinals. Oh, two. Cardinals down to their last strike. Rounded to Herbeck, foul ball. Still 0-2. Pena and the Cardinals one more night in Minneapolis. A reminder, those of you on the West Coast, Cal against UCLA College Football following. 0-2. One and two. Popped up. Lodner coming over, and the Twins send it to seven. Al Michael with me a couple of stars in the ball game all three of them Ken Herbeck did you feel that they had to hear from you three guys today offensively you've been kind of quiet the World Series it's been the whole talk me and Kirby group group doing with a big home run for us to, to put us one uh, I guess tie it up I guess I don't know what the heck it did but we four hits Kirby. four hits four runs scored nice going well thanks Ridge I was just trying to just hit the ball up the middle of the day two to have to change up just trying to stay back and just stay within myself like I've been all year and 
Uh, I was just glad to do it today. Johnny Baylor, a lot of experience. Mr. Clutch again, a big home run. Well, there's a change up down. I'm pretty sure it's a good pitch for Tudor, but in that situation, I was looking to drive in the run, and so it happened I hit it out of the ballpark. Minnesota Twins, you guys come home, you never say die. Let's go back up to Al Michaels. <laughs> Thank you, Reggie. So that's the story from Minneapolis. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Tim McCarver saying so long from the Dome, where the Twins even the series at three games apiece, beating the Cardinals today 11-5. Coming up next on the West Coast, California and UCLA. Then tomorrow on ABC Sports, the McDonald's Basketball Open features the Soviet Union against the NBA's Milwaukee Bucks. And then tomorrow night, the one-game showdown. Game 7 of the World Series from the Metrodome. 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Game 6 of the 1987 World Series has been brought to you by Merrill Lynch. By... Budweiser, Beachwood Aged for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By AT&T, the right choice. And by Chevrolet, the official car and truck of Major League Baseball. This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as a leader in sports television. We'll see you tomorrow.